Hello everybody, welcome to the first week of QSO 630. In this first week, I'm basically going to cover what generally is, is a supply chain. And I'm going to go over how supply chains have the same attributes as a system. Um, a lot of this is going to be uh, a supplement to the book. This does not replace the book, so please read the book. And um, this will help augment what you read in the book, as will future lectures that I provide in this class. So, what is supply chain management? It generally is a set of approaches used to efficiently integrate suppliers, manufacturers, and stores, or you can call them retailers. Uh, basically, it's a set of approaches used to efficiently, efficiently integrate from raw materials all the way to a customer demand. So, an effective supply chain manage, management system provides uh, products at the right quantities, at the right locations, at the lowest cost, and as needed by the service level. And when we talk about service level, I'm just going to cover this briefly for now. Um, in a couple weeks, we're going to talk about customer service level in more detail. Uh, basically, a service level is the level of comfort that the supply chain manager places on being able to, to satisfy all customer demand. So if you, as you're going to see, you, you're not able to put product directly in the customer's hands immediately. So you have to use forecasting and front-loading supplies and things like, like this in order to predict or do what you can to make sure that, that the customer has the best likelihood of receiving the product they want. And there are trade-offs. With a high customer service level, you may have to have a lot of inventory in your system to meet that, that potential like 100% customer service level. If you have a low customer service level, you have less supplies in your supply chain, but you stand the risk of not having enough product for the customer if you had a, a, um, an un unforeseen change in the demand for your product. So these are all trade-offs that we're going to talk about during the class. So that's generally what customer service level is. And as I said, I'm going to be going through this in more detail in the class as we go forward. This is basically just to be to familiarize with basic concepts of supply chain management. Now, supply chain as a system, I use a modified Deming diagram to discuss how a supply chain works as a system. In this uh, drawing here, you have you have the supply chain starts with step zero, which is the the customer demand itself, the thing that the customer wants. And in that regard, it can be um, a particular product that the customer knows they want. It could be something new that you that your marketing uh, department may foresee a demand for. Regardless, this is the idea that is behind the design of the product. So once you have this idea, it goes to product design and redesign. In the chapter one, they talk about the development chain, and this is pretty much where this fits. The development chain is all about developing the product that we are going to create through the supply chain. And obviously, as your design changes more frequently, the more disruptive that is to the supply chain. So ideally, the best thing to do is to get the customer idea down as, as, as firm as possible. And then you have your design, and you feed that design to your suppliers or here to your to your raw materials so that your suppliers began to pull raw materials to make the product that you want. Then it goes from suppliers to manufacturing, they make your product, distribution receives a product and distributes it to various retailers. Um, as you're gonna see, many there are many different ways to do this. In some cases, you may not, you may not even have a distributor. Sometimes they go strictly from supplier to manufacturing straight to a retailer, or sometimes from a supplier straight to a retailer. It just depends on the, the design of the, of, of the supply chain. And sometimes they do that because when you decrease the number of entities within a supply chain, it reduces the complexity of the, of the supply chain. But unfortunately, when you reduce the complexity of the supply chain, the ability of the supply chain to react to unforeseen changes and variation is diminished. So you always want to keep a certain level of what, what they call requisite variety 
in your supply chain so that your supply chain can react quickly and efficiently to unforeseen changes. So in this diagram, we go from the retailer to the customer, and the customer receives a product. Now, this is not covered much in the in the book, but I want to cover it for those of you who deal with service supply chains. When the customer uses the product, um, they they either um, dispose of it, or they may buy a new one, or they may have a problem with it. Maybe they have the product and they asked for a blue one and they got a red one instead. And this is what the product support function is. The product, product support function either returns the product to its desired state, which is where we're pulling um, resources from manufacturing comes from, or it orders a new one to be sent to them, or it gathers information about what they liked or disliked about it. And this information is fed to the product design and redesign so that they can change the product based upon the experiences that the customer has with the product. And then we go through this all over again. So it, it is an iterative closed loop process. It goes over and over again in a healthy supply chain. Um, once again, they don't talk about this part very much, the, the, the product support side of it. But this is, this is gained in relevance recently as companies are trying to use a, a more 360 degree method to better understand how their products are used, especially when you have multiple markets where you may have one market, one product trying to satisfy multiple markets. So that's what this is all about. I'm just basically going to provide this for your information and your curiosity. If you want more information, please let me know in the class and I can probably pull some stuff up for you to look at. Um, that's not a problem. But uh, for now, I'm just gonna let you guys see this, absorb it, and understand it. For most of the class, we're only going to focus on this bottom part, which is the actual product going from the raw materials to the customer. Now, in chapter one, they talk about the development and product support chains. And this is similar to the, well, um, forgive me, they talk about the, the development chain. And this is similar to the previous diagram. And what they do is they have basically have the four functions within a supply chain. Supply, produce, distribute, and sell. Um, I, I just changed the names, you know, supplier, manufacturer, distributor, and retailer. But it's the same thing. And from here you have a, a supply chain that deals with pulling the supplies to make a certain product. Here you have the, the development chain that ensures that the correct product is created based upon customer wants and needs. And then, you know, distribute, they just distribute the parts. I guess here you put warehouses and trucks. Um, and then here I added the product support chain. And the product support chain is part of the closed loop where we, you know, sell the product, the customer uses the product, and then we get feedback from the customer either to return the product to its to its desired state, either provide a new product or get feedback about how the product was used as much firsthand as possible. And then the, the supply chain provides products to here. And then um, the, in, a, in a healthy supply chain, the product support function provides information to the plan and design section of the development chain so that they can better understand how to improve the product. So supply chains have characteristics that are very similar to systems in general. A system in general is two or more essential parts that interact together to achieve a common goal. So now, with that being said, supply chains have essential parts. Okay, uh, for instance, you need to have a supplier. You must have a manufacturing. Um, in some cases, you know, you need to have a customer. You need, you need to have demand for a part, obviously. Um, some people are, argue about whether or not you need a distributor or other parts, but there are e definitely essential parts within a, a system. Now, one element of, a, of, of any system is that the, the habits of one entity within a system has a, ha, can have an indirect effect on the, on the performance or on the ability of other parts of a system to perform. And this is very true of a supply chain. Each entity in a supply chain is directly affected by other entities, both inside and outside the supply chain. Inside the supply chain, 
let's say if there's a disruption in manufacturing. Well, well, well when that occurs, your lead time to get parts and product to the customer will increase all of a sudden, which will cause a disruption because you, you, you stand a chance of product outages. So, and let's say that there's a problem with the design. If you have a problem with the design, then you make a whole bunch of product that nobody wants, in which case you have a whole bunch of product that's just sitting there that is not being sold. Or, you know, let's say that the development cycle is constantly changing the design of the part. Well, the, the supplier, the production side of the house, will continually have to keep throwing away or retooling or rebuilding product based upon these changes in the design. And, this, and, and, and these ripple through the supply chain. So uh, maximizing the performance of one part of the supply chain can result in suboptimizing the supply chain as a whole. This is a very important systems concept where let's say, um, and we're gonna talk about this late in the class, around eight, week eight, week nine, where we talk about different types of contracts where each entity within the supply chain is going to work towards their own best interest. So for instance, a retailer is going to try to push as much of the risk and cost onto the manufacturer as possible. And the manufacturer is going to try to push as much risk and cost to the retailer. So if, if each site optimizes their own strategy, they directly impact the ability of the other parts to perform to a certain level and as a result suboptimize the supply chain as a whole. So there are strategies that you could use to help mitigate a lot of this um, optimizing of, of the parts. So um, un uncertainty and risk is inherent in each supply chain and that's true. For instance, you never know the exact customer demand. We use forecasting. Um, to try to predict future demand and as a result um, there's no saying that we use that you use forecasting yet no forecast is ever correct so obviously the accuracy of, of your forecast influences the ability of your supply chain to provide parts so there's certain statistical process control functions where we can understand the variation within your demand and your lead time so, uh, and we will cover these later in the class. Exact product availability for the manufacturer is never known. Um, for instance, um, you may say, that, okay, we need 30 parts of uh, 30 widgets by next month, but you don't know if the manufacturer is going to be, be able to make 30 part, well, widgets. They may have it scheduled, but then they may have a weather event that disrupts their manufacturing and they can only provide 15 or 20 and since we we can't provide the product immediately to the customer or uh, direct from manufacturing as required that creates risk and uncertainty in your supply chain and the exact lead time is never known you may have a very good lead time but then if a hurricane hits or if there's a service disruption uh, if there's strikes the ability to get the product between your entities may be impacted. So your your exactly time is never known. The product is not av immediately available to each entity when needed. Once again, your your product has to go needs to be shipped or or sent to each of the different entities within the supply chain. Which is why a lot of um, companies try to reduce the supply chain. So you reduce the risk associated. Now, when you go to an international supply chain, your ability to do this is obviously limited. But nonetheless, um, the product is not immediately available to each entity when needed, and that's very important. As a result, you don't know when you're going to get it, and you don't know if you're going to get everything until it, sh until it shows up at the dock. And sometimes I, I've personally seen where companies will intentionally mislead the next stage in the supply chain. So yeah, yeah, you'll, you'll get 50 units by Friday, but then all of a sudden only 30 show up. Or they may get 50, but they may get 20 empty boxes. Or they, or they may, you know, things, there are ways to manipulate the information. So you, so you never know exactly when you're going to get the product that you request. And, and as I mentioned before, service disruptions can occur at any time due to weather, changing, changes in customer consumption, seasonality, advertising. I've also, um, something else that you can use is is a uh, if if someone finds a replacement 
for your product that may be cheaper or may, or, or may have another attribute that they like more than yours. So you never really know how the customer is, is going to continue to, to act towards your product. And of course, obsolescence. This is a key one. Um, because we have to build ahead of time, you may try to build a whole bunch, and let's say you can't sell them all. That's why we have like overstock.com. Well, all of a sudden, you may have obsolete parts. Um, the, in my industry, the defense industry, this happens quite a bit, where you suddenly have obsolete parts that you just can't get rid of. In which case, then you have to sell them cheaply, or you have to dispose them through third parties, or whatever. So these are all risks that you have to deal with as a as a supply chain. Now, uh, different entities within the supply chain have different and conflicting objectives. This is very important to understand. And in many cases, the objectives run counter to others. So, for example, marketing's goal is to sell as much as possible. So they'll, um, I've seen this many times where they get a big order to sell 1,000 items, but manufacturing may only be able to make 200 items a month. So now what are you going to do? You have to make 800 pro items somehow by, by the end of the month. And in many cases, the company goes, well, that's money sitting on the vine. So manufacturing, you're going to have to find a way to make 800 more. And that creates, creates a lot of stress in the supply chain. And not only in manufacturing, but in distribution. It now has to deal with having to ship additional products. So this ripples through the supply chain and can cause a lot of problems. And, and instead of what we do, uh, something that I'm going to cover later in the class, called demand smoothing and this is a fairly recent strategy that is used in like lean and theory of constraints to smooth the demand so that you reduce the impact to manufacturing and the supply chain as a whole i will cover that in later weeks and so um, actions actions such as outsourcing can actually increase the system complexity this is important because many cases you may outsource a certain part of your supply chain to another company well, you just take on all of their complexity, all of their ability to provide for your product. Add it on to the fact that they've never, they may be new to making your product specifically, so they, they may have some growing pains. So when you move to actions such as outsourcing, you have to understand these impacts so that you can create a risk mitigation plan to, to ad, address this, um, these potential risks. So not all entities in the supply chain have all the information required to make a decision. This is very true. Um, you can look at two different people within the same supply chain, and they'll have two different types of, types of information. And this happens a lot because wherever you look in the supply chain, they look at, at it based from their own perspective. And, and for instance, lead time is a, is a good example. In many cases, I've seen where entities within a supply chain view lead time from uh, the raw materials to their point. Well, in a supply chain, the lead time should go all the way to the customer, but this data can be massaged so that they may like hide bad news. Or, or sometimes, if, if you're in competition with, with, with certain entities, um, or if you have a bad relationship with them, they may withhold information from you out of a lack of trust. And this happens quite a bit, actually. So um, obviously having a good, a good relationship within your supply chains is recommended. So, and variations occur in the supply chain over time. And these are just three of them. You got lead time, demand, and manufacturing rate. There's, all the, there's also other ones that we're gonna go through. But um, variations occur because systems, unless, it, unless it's a mechanical system, and even then, me mechanical systems over a long period of time don't run with exact precisions. No systems run precisely. You have oscillations due to interactions between the parts. Um, if you're interested in understanding this in more context, I'm going to provide a, an announcement that discusses these oscillations and variation in a system. If when you see this, you want more information, please let me know and I'll be more than happy to, to provide it to you. Um, would that involve basically I'm just um, I just covered how how supply chains operate as a system and basic concepts of a supply chain I, I gave you uh, a a graphic of how a supply chain can be viewed as a system as a closed loop from raw materials all the way to the customer and all the way through the product use all the way back to the raw materials 
So, um, and, and with this, you can use this as a closed loop idea to understand supply chains in more detail. And I also talked about the development and product support chains, where I talked about the development chain where we design the product that is going to be produced. And then uh, towards the end, when the, when the customer buys the product, where we are going to, to look at how the customer uses the, the, the product and then either correct any deficiencies, uh, provide a new product if there's, if there's a problem with like quality or something, or we will take information from this to make the product better meet customer expectations. So um, I'm not going to cover product support very much in this class unless there's people in the class that really need more detail. So please feel free to let me know if you want more detail on product support supply chains. I'd be more than happy to, to provide it. If there's any questions in class, please feel free to, to post them in the general discussions forum and I will be more than happy to answer them and get back with you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.